Therefore Morgoth came, climbing slowly from his subterranean throne, and the rumor of his feet was like thunder underground. And he issued forth clad in black armor, and he stood before the king like a tower, iron crowned, and his vast shield, sable unblazoned, cast a shadow over him like a storm cloud. But Fingolfin gleamed beneath it as a star, for his mail was overlaid with silver, and his blue shield was set with crystals, and he drew his sword Ringle that glittered like ice. Well met, my friends, Yoiston here with part two of Melkor, or Morgoth's epic character history. Last week we made it to the Siege of Angband, and that's where we'll be picking up today. If you haven't seen part one of this series, I'll leave a link to it in the description below. Before we get started, I wanted to wish you all a happy New Year's in the Reunited Kingdom, as today was the day that the One Ring was destroyed in the Legendarium, and it became Gondor and Arnor's New Year's. Here's to another year and more to come in Middle-earth. Now let's jump into part two of the Dark Lord's history. Throughout the years that the Noldor held the siege upon Engband, Morgoth tried multiple times to free his fortress. One such attempt was when Morgoth caused the Iron Mountains to erupt, and he sent an army of orcs through the passes, but this was in vain as the elves held their ground and easily defeated Morgoth's forces. The only thing that he could really do was capture elves, break their minds, and turn them into spies among the Noldor, so that Morgoth was updated on his enemy's plans and movements. A hundred years later, Morgoth sent an army of orcs north to approach Hithlum from the east in order to surprise the elves that lived there, but the army under Fingon, the eldest son of Fingolfin, defeated them again. After all of these failed attempts to break the siege, Morgoth realized that mere orcs were no match for the Eldar so he would have to create something more deadly for his army. Now, as we learned in the first part, Melkor never found the flame imperishable, as it resided only in Iluvatar, so he could not create autonomous beings. However, he could perverse creatures, or make beasts that are mockeries of fair beings, and that is exactly what he did, as he created Glaurong, the first dragon. I believe dragons and fell beasts were mockeries of Manwe's great eagles. However, as Glaurong was the first, he did not have wings. After another century, but still in his infancy, Glaurong surprised both his master and the elves by going forth from Engband, where he scattered the elves, but was hindered by Fingon's archers, so he fled the battle. As he was still in his youth, Glaurong's hide was not strong enough to resist elven arrows. Even though Morgoth was greatly displeased, this incident had little effect on the rest of the war. As Glaurong was still growing and the war continued, men had come to Beleriand from Middle-earth, and the long peace began. Hoping to corrupt them and turn them against the Eldar, Morgoth snuck out of Angband and spread deceit and lies among men. They were far easier to corrupt than the elves were, but a small group of men known as the Edain resisted him, while others went to join him or departed from the northern lands altogether. But the growing strength of the Noldor's kingdoms worried Morgoth, so he returned to Angband and left his task of corrupting men behind. In 455 of the First Age, the same amount of years after Fingolfin's host arrived in Beleriand, Morgoth's plan came to fruition. One winter night, when the elves were least vigilant, Morgoth sent rivers of fire and lava from Thangorodrim, and poisonous fumes from the Iron Mountains. This alone slew many of the Noldor and the lands that they walked upon. In this chaos, a fully grown Glaurong emerged, as did the Balrogs, and armies of orcs and other foul creatures in amounts that the elves never even thought of. This began Dagor Bragrulok, or the Battle of the Sudden Flame. The elves were scattered, and the sons of Feanor and Finarfin, with the exception of Meadros, were overthrown. Fingolfin and Fingon's forces were able to defend the land of Hithlum, while many of the Sindar or Grey Elves were driven from the forests of Dorthonion, and many forsook the war altogether and went to Doriath, where Thingol and Melion were. Fingolfin fell into despair when he learned of the totality of this disaster, and when he believed that the salvation of the Noldor was hopeless, he rode out to duel Morgoth in single combat. He came in such terrible wrath and fury, resembling the Vala Orome to some, that orcs fled from him. Striking the doors of Angband, Fingolfin challenged Morgoth to this duel. Morgoth didn't want to engage, and out of all of the Valar, he feared death most. However, the captains heard Fingolfin calling Morgoth Craven, so in order to maintain his reputation among the ranks, Morgoth went forth to meet the High Elf. Wielding the hammer Grond, Melkor struck at the Elf Lord, but missed several times, creating fiery pits in the ground. 
Fingolfin evaded the Dark Lord, wounding him seven times. But the elf grew weary, and Morgoth drove him to his knees three times, but each time Fingolfin arose. But after the third, he fell backwards into one of the craters created by Grand. Morgoth set his foot upon Fingolfin's neck, ready to break his foe. But Fingolfin smote his foot with the sword Ringel, giving Morgoth a permanent limp. But the Dark Lord broke the elf's body, and wanted to decimate the corpse, but Thorondor and his eagles came to save Fingolfin's body, and their talons tore Morgoth's face. This marked the beginning of the end of the battle, as the free peoples of men and elves began to muster, and push back against Morgoth's outlying forces. And so the enemy retreated to Angband, and called his armies back as well. He even sent out spies and messengers to men also, feigning pity. But I don't believe anyone in their right minds would listen to Morgoth at this point, and the Edain refused. And so Morgoth summoned the Easterlings to come over the Blue Mountains to harass the men in battle. After seven years, Morgoth renewed the assault that started with Dagor Bragolach by assaulting Hithlum where many elves yet lived, but he was repelled by Círdan and his host who aided Fingon. Years later, the deeds of Baron and Luthien commenced. Baron, who was a man, was only able to marry Luthien, the daughter of Thingol and Melion, if he recovered a Silmaril from the crown of Morgoth. While Morgoth sat upon his throne, Baron and Luthien infiltrated Angband in disguises, and Luthien conceived a song after Morgoth saw through her disguise. As the Dark Lord began to daze off into sleep, he had an evil lust for the elf maiden, but Luthien's song worked, and the entirety of Morgoth's court fell into slumber. His head slumped, and he fell from his throne, and the Iron Crown rolled away. Baron drew the knife Ancrist, and pried loose a Silmaril from the crown. While trying to get another Silmaril, however, the knife snapped, and a shard pierced Morgoth's cheek, awakening the Dark Lord. Baron and Luthien ran, and Morgoth's werewolf caught up to them, and eventually consumed the Silmaril, which drove him mad and made him flee into the wild. The eagles saved Baron and Luthien, but in his fury of losing a Silmaril, Morgoth caused the Iron Mountains to erupt. This Silmaril would eventually go to Arendil, and it would contribute to the Dark Lord's fall. Soon after these events, Morgoth became aware that Meadros was plotting a great union against him, and so both the Free Peoples and Morgoth's forces prepared for battle. This became known as the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, and caused great casualties on both sides. Because of the new schism caused by Thingol's possession of the Silmaril from Morgoth's werewolf, the sons of Feanor and Thingol were on negative terms, and this division caused for almost no warriors to be sent by Thingol. Using his dark powers of the dragons, balrogs, and others, Morgoth's forces won this battle, and caused the defeat of many free peoples. Fingon, son of Fingolfin, and king of Gondolin fell in this large conflict, and so the throne of Gondolin passed to Torgon, his brother. Morgoth wanted to know of this place, as it was one of the last refuges of the High Elves, and so the Dark Lord captured Hurin, a lord among men, and tortured him so that he may give up the location of the city, and finally, Morgoth could crush his Noldorian enemies. Hurin did not give up this information, however, even in torture, so Morgoth put a curse upon his house. Hurin was forced to watch his son Turin and daughter Nyanor suffer and fall in love with one another due to Morgoth's curse, and eventually it ended with the defeat of Glaurong and the deaths of Turin and Nyanor. Eventually, Hurin was released into the world to live in his grief and madness. Still looking for the city of Gondolin, as he hated and feared the House of Fingolfin most, and it was prophesied that his doom would come from the House of Turgon, Morgoth captured Maeglin, the nephew of Turgon, and threatened him with torture until the elf betrayed his folk and willingly told Morgoth the location of Gondolin. Morgoth went further and even secured Maeglin's loyalty by promising him the elf Idril, who Maeglin had lusted after. Soon afterwards, Morgoth brought his forces to bear against Gondolin, and he sacked the city, although he lost Gothmog, the Lord of the Balrogs, and many other forces in the process, as well as Maeglin himself, who was killed by Tuor, Idril's husband. After the destruction of the city, the Noldor had no great kingdoms left, save for the havens of Círdan and the mouths of Sirion. Morgoth felt as though he'd already won, and he laughed at the third kinslaying and felt nothing for the Silmaril that Baron and Luthien had taken from him. However, this Silmaril would be a part of his downfall. The son of Idril and Tor of Gondolin, named Arendil, took this exact Silmaril over the seas to persuade the Valar to help them defeat Morgoth once and for all. And just as Manwë could not understand evil, 
Melkor could not comprehend compassion, and he assumed that the Valar would never help the elves after their sins, but they heard the pleas of Arendil and assembled their forces. With the hosts of Amon and the other free peoples, the War of Wrath began. Most all creatures in Middle-earth fought in this war. Even the largest dragon of likely not just Tolkien's works, but of all writings was defeated in these battles, as Arendil guided his boat into the sky, and with the help of the eagles, they threw down on Kelagon the Black. Melkor was defeated and fled into the depths of his mines, until his feet were hewn out from under him, and he fell and was bound with the chain Engainor by the Valar once again. The two Silmarils remaining in his crown were taken, but lost again soon after, and the Iron Crown itself was beaten into a collar for him. I'd bet Tulkas enjoyed doing that. <laughs> this time there would be no chances for him, and Melkor was thrown through the Door of Night into the Timeless Void, and thus ended the First Age, and Melkor's time in Middle-earth, until Dagger Daggeroth, that is. I'll leave a link to the Dagger Daggeroth video in the description, but ultimately it was possible that Melkor would return to the Earth at the end of time for his death, before the world would be remade in the second music of the Ainur. But, as we come to know in Tolkien's other writings, even though Melkor would be worshipped in dark cults, he would not be the last Dark Lord. From Melkor, we may learn to have compassion and understanding for one another, things he never had. And sometimes we must face our issues head on for a better life, for ourselves or others, like Fingolfin did. Melkor is the pure embodiment of immortal evils, that shall go on for as long as we allow them to. We must learn to come together and have compassion and love for one another, like the Valar had for the Free Peoples, so we may banish the inhumanities of our own world. Thank you all so much for watching this second part of Melkor's character history. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please hit that like button and share this video with a friend. I'm looking to do more of a lighthearted video next Sunday, as we have talked about many battles and wars for a few weeks now, and seeing that next week is April Fools, leave a fun video suggestion in the comments below, and please let me know your thoughts about the original Dark Lord as well. If you'd like to contact me more directly, please join me on Facebook and Twitter through the links in the description below, and don't forget to subscribe to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today. I appreciate you guys so much, and as always, thank you all for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my friends.